Hello, this is Michael Tracy, and this video is going to discuss the various mistakes in a recent Veritasium video entitled How Quantum Computers Break the Internet. Veritasium typically makes excellent videos that debunk popular science myths. My favorite video of his is the post-truth video, ostensibly about lead in gasoline. So I was a little surprised to see Veritasium release a video that uses all the pseudo sciencey things he is known so well for debunking. For regular visitors to my channel, a frequent theme is that the truth is often more interesting than popular fiction. For Mallory and Irvin, if you take the time to learn the actual facts about their 1924 climb of Mount Everest, it paints a far more interesting story than the popular fiction that they foolishly attempted to climb the second step, an obstacle that would give them little to no chance of reaching the summit. For Shor's algorithm, the popularized pseudoscience presented in Veritasium's video leaves out the real genius of the algorithm and also blocks many learning opportunities for younger students to see the direct application of skills they are learning. Shor's algorithm presents an excellent example of a genius invention that can be understood by anyone with a high school understanding of mathematics, with the single exception being the quantum Fourier transformation, which would easily be understood by anyone who understands the discrete Fourier transformation, and that is easily made understandable by various three blue and one brown videos on the subject. Shor's algorithm also presents an example of an invention that is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. It requires only one single insight into quantum computing. The rest is made up of numerous smaller insights into mathematics. To be sure, the proofs of the effectiveness of the algorithm, which Shor devotes the majority of the mathematics in his paper to, are well beyond the high school level but I will break down what the algorithm actually does, and for each step, you can pause the video and see if you can figure it out on your own. You likely can. So what did Veritasium get wrong? To start with, there's the clickbait thumbnail that implies quantum computers will mean, quote, no secret is safe. Quantum computers do not break all encryption, and in the introduction, he talks about breaking military secrets. Military systems generally do not use public key encryption, as such organizations can use one-time pads, which are mathematically proven to be unbreakable, no matter how many quantum computers you invent. Of course, Veritasium himself did a video explaining why YouTubers make clickbait thumbnails, so he is just following the science. Getting into the video, the notion that quantum computers perform all the calculations at the same time is just plain wrong. This is simply not the way anything in nature works. While no one knows exactly how quantum mechanics works, various laws of nature conserve energy and do not allow entropy to simply be destroyed. If a quantum system was indeed calculating all the numbers at the same time, that would be a dramatic increase in the information inside the system, which is the same as saying a dramatic decrease in entropy. According to this pseudoscience theory, nature then throws all that information away when a measurement is performed. Though measurements are just entanglement with an external system, so it is not clear how nature would know that this particular entanglement was being used as part of a quantum computer so that she could discard her notes. Scott Aronson, a quantum researcher, notes that the popular science explanation, quote, makes physicists howl in agony. I'll link to that article so you can read how he prefers to describe quantum computation, but ultimately no one knows the actual mechanics of quantum mechanics. At a more fundamental level, no one knows what an electron is, nor what a photon is, nor whether photons even exist. In fact, Veritasium did an excellent video debunking popular misconceptions about electricity. But stating quantum computers perform all the calculations at the same time simply does not make sense, as you will see for yourself if you stick around to the end of the video. The next mistake is not so much a mistake, but a misstatement of the important piece of Shor's algorithm. The key to Shor's algorithm is not the quantum Fourier transformation. Otherwise, any algorithm that used discrete Fourier transformation could be sped up by running it on a quantum computer, and that is simply not the case. Peter Shor tells us what the key to the algorithm is in his paper. The bottleneck to the quantum factoring algorithm, i.e. the piece of factoring algorithm that consumes the most time and space, is modular exponentiation. Modular exponentiation and how to perform it efficiently on a quantum computer is the key to Shor's algorithm, but the basics can be understood with high school math, as Peter Shor explains in the same paper. Modular exponentiation is taking the power of a number and then using so-called clock arithmetic to only keep the remainder. Thus, 2 to the power of 20 is 1048576, and you can compute the remainder 77 to get 67. As with Veritasium, I will use 77 as the nilf, or number I'd like to factor. Naively, you can perform modular exponentiation by multiplying 2 20 times in a row and then dividing by 77 and taking the remainder. 
However, performing it in that manner would not provide any benefit in factoring numbers. Fortunately, there is a much easier way to do it, and you can pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Veritasium described the quantum computer doing it in this naive version in his video, but that is not the way it is computed on an actual quantum computer. Peter Shore didn't need to figure out how to, to do it, as he says in his paper. The technique he uses for computing x to z mod n is essentially the same as the classical method. By repeated squaring, we compute x to the 2 to the i mod n, then to obtain the result, multiply the numbers we just computed by the binary expansion of the exponent. I will work with 77 as the nilf, and I will use 2 as the base, which Shore has as the variable x. I use 2 because it will be co-prime with any legitimate number you wish to factor, so 2 to the 15 mod 77 can be done by computing 2 to the 8 mod 77, 2 to the 4 mod 77, 2 to the 2 mod 77, 2 to the 1 mod 77, and multiplying them all together, again taking the mod at the end. But hopefully you can see the rather obvious optimization that makes up the repeated squaring. There is no need to keep recomputing each number. Once we have 1, you can just square it and then take mod 77. That is, there is no reason to compute 2 to the 8 mod 77, as you would have just computed 2 to the 4 mod 77, and then you can just square that number and perform mod 77. This transforms the problem from one of integer factorization into a type of modular subset product problem. For any nilf, the pigeonhole principle guarantees that the period will be less than the nilf. To find the period, you need to find which binary powers when multiplied together equal 1. For 77, we have these powers. And that is how Shor's algorithm actually performs what is labeled as modular exponentiation. The quantum computer does not exponentiate anything. All that is done on the classical computer, and the quantum computer just multiplies the numbers together and performs the modular arithmetic. As Shor said, thus, in order to program quantum computers most efficiently, work needs to be done on the best way of implementing elementary arithmetic operations on quantum computers. Veritasium explains the number theory of periods modulo a given number, but a quantum computer doesn't use any of that. You feed in numbers that are guaranteed by the pigeonhole principle to have a period, and the quantum computer finds that period. Unfortunately, Veritasium also describes a process of getting the period completely incorrectly. He first says, we raise g to the power of the first set of qubits, which we don't, nothing is raised to any power. Then he says, we divide by n, which is also not done. Division on a quantum computer is extremely difficult, and Shor's algorithm does not touch it. Veritasium then says we store the remainder in the second set of qubits, and while the remainder will eventually get into that set of qubits, it is not in this fashion. The way the calculation works is you perform your multiplication as a series of additions, and you subtract your nil from the result. If that results in a negative, you add your nil back in. The entire algorithm relies on being able to compute the remainder on partial results, as computing all the powers, as was stated in the Veritasium video, is not feasible. The number of qubits would be exponential. Shor's algorithm does use an ancillary set of qubits, but it is used to reverse the calculation, as all quantum co computations must be reversible to be efficient. That is, you could do a non-reversible calculation, but for each calculation it would require an additional qubit be added to the system. Reversible computing, entropy, and ultimately whether the universe we live in is reversible are fascinating questions. And while Peter Shore does not get philosophical in his paper, he notes numerous times how important reversible computing is, the word reversible appearing 36 times in his 28-page paper, but not once in the Veritasium video. Peter Shore also refers to the qubits used to reverse the operation as a workspace and notes, the algorithm will use two quantum registers which hold integers represented in binary. There will also be some amount of workspace. This workspace gets reset to zero after each subroutine of our algorithm, so we will not include it when we write down the state of our machine. Unfortunately, Veritasium uses two registers to compute what he refers to as modular exponentiation, not realizing that Shore actually uses three registers and left the workspace out of the description. It is not clear if this mistake is what causes everything else about Shor's algorithm in the video to be incorrect, but from that point forward in the video, everything is wrong. Even attempting to correct for this mistake by assuming the registers do indeed contain what he claims, his analysis is still wrong. And this is unfortunate because the trick of getting the period with just a single measurement is really very clever. So first, I'll go through Veritasium's mistakes and then describe the problem Shor needed to solve, and you can pause the video and see if you can figure it out. It is fairly easy and can be performed in one line of Python code.
Peritasium says, if we don't measure the entire superposition, but only the remainder part, we will obtain some random remainder, but this remainder won't occur just once, it will occur multiple times. This does not make any sense. It would not make any difference if you measure all the qubits or just a subset. They are entangled in a maximally entangled state. And you don't care what the remainders are. You can compute any remainder you wish on a classical computer easily enough using modular squaring technique. Veritasium described this measuring part of the qubits as a trick, but it doesn't do anything if done properly. And if done in Veritasium states would just give you one computation that would not factor anything. Even if the so-called trick were applied at the proper time, to do the measurements, it would not make any difference. Peter Shore even says so in his paper. When the actual measurement is made, you can either measure just the one register or both of them. It makes no difference and it is not any type of trick. Veritasium then implies that somehow you get all of one remainder by using this so-called trick. You can't. Shore does not mention taking any measurements prior to performing the quantum Fourier transformation as part of the algorithm. Later, Shore does comment that for error checking, you could measure one of the scratch qubits to make sure it was zero, because if it was not zero, it would mean that there was an error in the computation. It is an interesting way to use the ancillary workspace as a type of error detection, but it is not necessary for the algorithm, and possibly Veritasium thought this interesting aside from Shore was some key trick to the algorithm. It isn't. Not even Wikipedia shows anything like Veritasium's algorithm. In fact, the Wikipedia article provides a correct description of the algorithm, but unfortunately re repeats the pseudoscience nonsense about computing everything simultaneously, of course without a citation to any reference. Veritasium then applies the quantum Fourier transformation and somehow gets fractions, even though there would be no way to store these fractions. If you did want to store fractions that were always 1 divided by some number, you would simply store the number and then invert it once it was out of the quantum computer. In addition, it shows that all of the states are 1 over r. A bigger problem is that Shor's algorithm is probabilistic. In fact, it only gives the correct answer 1 out of 4 times in the worst case, and 50% of the time with typical numbers. As soon as you came to a quantum state that always output the correct value, you should know something was very wrong. At no time is the value of the period, which Veritasium labels as r, anywhere in the quantum computer, nor 1 over r, nor anything close to r. Instead, you have to take one piece of information provided to you and use logic and math to deduce the value of R. Of course, you could also just brute force the computation of R by running the algorithm an exponential number of times, but that defeats any performance gain as it takes longer to factor than existing methods. So let me walk you through Shor's description of the algorithm in his paper, and there are many reference implementations and other versions out there on the internet. I'll link to one I made years ago in the description. Shore performs the modular multiplication by repeatedly applying modular addition and comes up with two registers. The first just has the numbers between 1 and q, with q being larger than the square of the nilf. The second register contains the remainders, but is not computed in the fashion Veritasium described. No measurement is taken, and then a quantum Fourier transformation is performed on the first register. This leaves a register with probability peaks. If you mapped out and counted those peaks, the number of peaks would be equal to r. That is, to compute r for even remotely sized NILFs, you would have to perform millions of these measurements to get this probability distribution and then count the number of peaks. The actual values contain more than just the peaks, as Peter Shore demonstrates in his paper. So the genius of Shore's algorithm is how to compute the period with just taking one measurement. Well, actually, that one measurement may fail, and you may need to repeat it, but it still has at least a 25% probability of giving you the correct answer with just one measurement. Shore gives a graph with a period of 10 to illustrate it, but I will illustrate how it works with a period of 8. You can think of it as being given a piece of pie, an actual pie, not the number. If you are given one eighth of a pie, you can easily figure out that the actual pie is 8 times larger. Similarly, if you are given 7 eighths of a pie, you can figure that 1 eighth of the pie is missing. But if you were given 4 eighths of a pie, that would simply be 1 half, and you would not directly know that it was split up using 1 eighth as the period. For getting 3 eighths and 5 eighths, knowledge that the size of the period is limited allows you to figure those out as well. That is, the period can't be 2 or 4 or 6 or 10. So that sort of narrows it down. But 2 eighths and 6 eighths give a period of 4 with all of this showing that the actual value of r is not stored anywhere, cannot be directly measured out, and will not always be computed accurately. 
Shor was aware of this problem and recommended multiplying the, the computed R by small factors such as 2 and 3 if it didn't first produce a result, which would solve the problem for our 2 eighths and 6 eight pieces of pi. You can run the reference implementation I gave, and it works for smaller numbers. You can run it for 77, better see how you don't get the bad values all the time, and you get good values, enough to make it a useful algorithm. If you look at the Python code, you see that it does take just the denominator of the earlier calculation, and perhaps that is where Veritasium got the idea that you just take the denominator. But it is all the other calculations that take place before it that allow this to be done. The value of R is not stored anywhere in that quantum computer. By this point, likely only the most devout of snow monkeys are still listening and likely asking, what is the point? How could the average person know there were problems with Veritasium's video? Even if you knew nothing about quantum computer, simply knowing how to factor 77 will tell you there are major problems with his explanation. Assuming everything Veritasium said is true, you should be wondering, why did Peter Shore do all this stuff? Why modular exponentiation? Why a quantum Fourier? Why bother with the period? If quantum computers can indeed perform billions of calculations at the same time, why not just divide your NILF by every number less than half the NILF mod the divisor, and then just measure out the ones with the remainder of zero? That is, 77 divided by anything other than 7 or 11 will give a remainder, so why not just eliminate those from the superposition and just leave the factors with a remainder of zero? The simple answer is that quantum computers do not work anywhere close to the way Veritasium describes. Peter Shor knew this and worked through various difficulties to get something that is inventive and that required a great deal of creativity and just plain hard work. It is not magic and you do not need to know every detail of the algorithm. But if someone cannot explain something so that it makes sense, your Yeti senses should start tingling.